Thank you for joining us for RHMD Wellness University. These are videos that I use to help you understand the results of your test so that when we come in and sit down, we don't have to spend so much time with a fundamental education, but really dig right into what matters to you. First off, I always like to go over why you should listen to me. I went to University of Florida for undergrad and I went to Ohio State, the Ohio State University for medicine. I have lots of board certifications and recently I was appointed faculty for GW, that's George Washington University in Alexandria, Virginia. So we're going to start with medicine's new frontier. Basically genetics. Are you born to and doomed based on your genes? Is it your destiny? Well, actually not. If we look at identical twins, even as they age, they don't have identical health issues. Traditional genetics. That's where we look at recessive and dominant genes, and we create those little flow charts with circles and squares to kind of tell how things happen in families. And most of the research on this started in the fields and ended up with the fruit flies. Today, we know it's more complicated than that. We have something called epigenetics and the epigenome. Basically, based on our environmental influences, we can turn and turn off genes that really have nothing to do with what happened with our parents or our parents' parents. And on the flip side, what happens with our parents and our parents' parents can impact and turn on genes while we're in the womb, even genes they don't have on. So Time Magazine has even done the cover, Why Your DNA Isn't Your Destiny. And it's primarily because of epigenetics. We know that cancer, immunomodulation, aging, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson are all epigenomes. So Dr. Francis Collins said, genetics loads the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. So let's talk about that environment pulling the trigger. If you're not aware, we're having what we call the 5A epidemic in our kids. That's autism, ADD, ADHD, allergies, asthma, and autoimmune. There was a Vermont study that's several years old now where they looked at the cord blood of babies from the 1990s. Now think about this. Vermont's kind of, you know, stony field farms. That's supposed to be where we're healthy. The cord blood had over 287 chemicals in it that were not supposed to be in a human. Canada in June 2013 did a similar study and they found more than 350 chemicals in the majority of the newborn's cord blood. I guess I should explain cord blood in case you don't know. When we deliver a baby, they put two clamps on the umbilical cord and they cut it. So the blood that spills when they cut the umbilical cord for a couple decades now, we've been collecting to do studies and research. That's called cord blood. So what are our epigenetic influences? Well, our diet, and whether or not we're malnourished, alcohol consumption, stress, uh-oh, I don't know anybody who doesn't have some of that, smoking, and environmental exposures. What you have to know is it triggers down several generations. We have some really good studies out of the Netherlands which shows that babies born two generations after a famine that happened in that area have the gene for obesity. And we're able because of these were small towns and kind of tightly knit communities to look at cadaver DNA, that's DNA of people who've already died, and know that their grandparents and their parents, if they're alive, don't have that gene. That's epigenetics in action. We also know that, unfortunately, when we're pregnant with our own babies, what we eat and drink turns on genes in them. So high fructose corn syrup and soda pop ice cream, a lot of junk food, actually turns on the gene for diabetes and obesity in our unborn babies. So we're going to talk about a specific gene today. It's not an epigenome, but I wanted to explain epigenetics so that you understand 
why genes are not destiny. So today we're going to talk about MTHFR, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. This is a single nucleotide polymorphism or a genetic difference that occurs among all of us. It is very common to have what we call a SNP in this area. Methylation is involved in so much in the human body. For example, when we make our hormones, primarily our estrogens, we have to go through a hydroxylation to methylation state. Now that's biochemistry, I know, but the methylation is what I want you to hear. To be able to successfully excrete these hormones from our body. So people who are impaired in their methylation don't excrete and balance their hormones very well. It's also about our energy balance, blood sugar balance, heart disease, neurotransmitters, how we sleep, how our gut works, how we respond to stress, how we use our antioxidants, our nitric oxide cycle, which impacts high blood pressure and you know, killing off germs, our thyroid, our adrenals, even our sex drive. It is a big player in how we detoxify the chemicals and the environmental exposures where we get every single day in this world. Methylation is also really important for sympathetic, parasympathetic tone. Now that again is kind of physiology. For those of you who don't know those words, that is our fight and flight versus rest and digest. So let's talk about how MTHFR was identified as a major player in human health. About a decade ago, we would check a screening homocysteine level in people that we thought were at risk for cardiovascular disease. We gave a lot of those people high dose folic acid, and guess what? A lot more heart attacks and strokes than we thought should happen. So everybody backpedaled. Nobody was checking out a screening homocysteine anymore. But what turned out was the genes behind it. If I'm impaired in my ability to methylate and I take high dose folic acid, it doesn't always feed into the methylation cycle the way it should. Remember, folic acid is man made. So sometimes what we make in the pharmaceutical lab is not better than what's in nature. So, from cardiovascular research and understanding the MTHFR SNP and how it played into it, we started using methyl support and nutrition, like methylfolate, methylcobalamin, SAMe, dimethylglycine, trimethylglycine, there's even more. But the important thing is, by using appropriate nutrition, you can support the methylation pathways. There's two main ones. There's MTHFR C677T, and that's the one we have the majority of the research in and MTHFR A1298C. Not as much research, but still a huge player. Here in our community, and I know this is an oversimplification for those of you who are real biochemists and, gen and molecular geneticists, I call C677T or I95 and A1298C or US1. We inherit a lane in each highway from our parents. And if our parents don't give us the lane, then when we put a lot of chemicals into our body that need methylated, or we strain those methylation pathways, we get into trouble. So how common is this genetic SNP? 30 to 40% of us are missing at least one lane. And it's a variable frequency among ethnicities. Surprisingly, Mediterraneans and Hispanics have more SNPs than Caucasians, than African Americans. What happens if we're missing lanes and we overwhelm our, uh, our pathways? We put too many cars on I-95 and US-1. Autoimmune disease, cancer, cardiovascular disease, remember that's where the, in the research started, fatigue, chronic viruses, fibromyalgia, hormonal imbalances, irritable bowel, other GI diseases, and mood issues. So let's talk about that research again. We were checking homocysteine and using high-dose folic acid. Well, who else do we use high-dose folic acid in? 
basically any young lady who is proactive and goes to her doctor and says, I want to become pregnant, or any of them that are pregnant. Turns out that when we are impaired in methylation and our pathways are overwhelmed, high dose folic acid can create miscarriages. It can also create infertility. So it's very important to know your MTHFR status if you're pregnant or planning to become that way. There actually is a prescription vitamin with methylated folate instead of the folic acid. I've not been able to get it covered by insurance yet because they want you to use the other one that's generic. But the other problem is most of the ingredients in there are not ideal anyways. There are better solutions. So the research on C677T is really strong, but the 1298C is not as complete, but really associated with a lot of things we see in our office every day. Fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, preeclampsia, hypertension, insomnia, tremors, autism, ADHD and ADD, schizophrenia, depression, bipolar, other mood disorders like that, recurrent miscarriages, cancer, and other symptoms of autoimmune disease like Renaud's. So if you look at the picture of the biochemistry of the methylation cycle, it's pretty confusing. And you need to remember that methylation is only one of the pathways in the human body. It is the one right now that we have the most research about, but you have to be careful that you don't do what we've done in traditional medicine. I'm trained as a traditional medical physician, but we tend to look at things in silos. The neurologist looks at neurology, the heart doctor looks at heart doctor, cardiovascular stuff, endocrinologist looks at hormones, and the overwhelming arch of how those things interrelate is sometimes ignored. For methylation, there's several other pathways. There's acetylation, glucuronidation, sulfation, more and more. You can't just pay attention to the methylation cycle and forget about the others. For example, there's several blogs out there that recommend anybody with an MTHFR defect to avoid niacin. Well, niacin is needed for other pathways in you. Now, I would agree that the high-dose niacin that we use in cardiovascular um, conditions would be contraindicated for somebody who's impaired in methylation, but I can't agree that everybody with an MTHFR defect needs to avoid niacin. So how do you know if you have an MTHFR SNP? Well, we can measure this in the lab. Unfortunately, it's a little tricky. A lot of the insurance companies are blocking our ability to order a genetic test. Some of them have loopholes. For example, if you've had three miscarriages, they'll let me check. But a lot of them, it's not possible to get it done. Fortunately, in our office, we have a couple alternatives where you can pay for it, self-pay, and get your results. There's also www.23andme.com. 23andme used to provide very comprehensive genetic testing to individuals for $99. I guess it's been a little over a year now that the FDA kind of shut down direct to consumer genetic testing. So now all they, have, all they offer is an ancestry kind of analysis. But the raw data is still there. And there's some other websites out there um, genegenie.org and I think the mthfr.net that will take with your permission and I think a small donation, I think it's like $10 for Gene Genie, and run the raw data that you get from 23andMe through their, their, through their database and come up with a report. A lot of those are very comprehensive. It doesn't just tell you your MTHFR status but a lot of other pathways too. And that brings us back full circle. You got to remember, just having the SNP, the little defect, doesn't mean it's playing a role in you and your body. If I haven't overwhelmed my methylation pathways and my cars on my highways are moving just fine, I don't necessarily need to do anything extra just because I have an MTHFR polymorphism. I can carry the gene for blue eyes even though I have green. You know, you really have to sit back and look at those reports and not freak out because they really are just a copy of what 
potentially could be there. So back to MTHFR and those highways, I-95 and US-1 and those cars. If I have missing lanes, otherwise known as polymorphisms in our methylation pathway, it is really important that we don't put too many cars on it. So what are the cars? The cars are those environmental toxins that we talk about so much. The pesticides, the fertilizers, the plastics. In fact, mercury has to be methylated to be rid out of the body. So if I have that SNP and I know it, it allows me to be proactive because I can't tolerate those chemicals like maybe somebody else can. And so I don't spread the fertilizer. The other thing, the homocysteine we mentioned earlier, it's kind of a backdoor look on how overwhelmed your methylation pathways are, in particularly to a cardiovascular standpoint. So if my homocysteine is above ideal, then I really need to worry about cleaning up my environment and I need to work on taking those supplements and nutritional things that help boost my methylation pathway. So that wraps up what I'm going to talk about with MTHFR and our genomics today. I look forward to reviewing with you your results and coming up with recommendations that are personalized to you. Thanks for joining me on your journey to becoming radiantly healthy.